If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, I want you to open up to the book of Luke and turn it into the 19th chapter. The book of Luke and turn it into the 19th chapter. I don't have a bunch of, we're not going to do a bunch of uh, uh, things up on the screen here, so I hope you have your Bibles or maybe pull out your, your phone there and look at it on your YouTube app or whatever it is, uh, version, not YouTube, <laughs> Uversion app there and uh, let's kind of follow along. Uh, I want to tell you a little story. I've kind of shared this before, uh, but when I was uh, uh, in moved uh, in fifth grade, we moved to a new a new school, a whole new area of the county, and um, so I started to play basketball. Now I know it doesn't look like I know how to play basketball, and I really don't, but I went out for the team. Okay, and in elementary school, if you went out for the team, it basically meant you got to be on the team. So I'm on the on the on the orange team, and there's a friend, uh, this young man. His name is Chuck, and he's on the black jersey team, and so we got orange jersey team, black jersey team, and we practiced together in the same elementary gymnasium, so we're on one side, they're on the other side. Now, I don't know Chuck, but Chuck lives down in town, and I live up on the hill uh, right across from the school. He lived down in town, and the thing I noticed about Chuck was he was always so angry all the time, and so if he missed a basket, he would just, he'd start getting all upset, and, and he'd slam the basketball down, and boom, it'd go up like that, and being the good kid that I was, I'd make fun of Chuck. And I would get Chuck going. I'd be like, oh, poor baby missed a basket. And I'd do all this different stuff. And he'd get real mad. And uh, that was my existence with Chuck. Now, I don't know him, but I'm making fun of Chuck, okay? Because he was, just seemed like he was always out of control. So that season, like in sixth grade, I'm in fifth grade. So let's come forward a couple of years. Now, I am uh, in ninth grade. I'm getting ready to go my freshman year. And uh, we go on a camping trip, a canoe camping trip with the, with the youth group. So it's the first big uh, high school event that I've ever gone to. And I'm like all excited because I'm getting ready to go into high school youth group. And I'm just all pumped up because our, our high school and junior high was, was separated out. So I never got to do anything with them. And I have two older brothers, and they've already been in the high school group for a while. So I tell my brother Ron, he's my middle brother, I tell him, Ron, I said, Ron, when we go, I want you to be in the boat with me. You know, we're going to share a canoe going down the little Miami River. So that's my goal. So I'm thinking everything's good because I don't really know everybody. I'm excited to be there, but I want to be with my brother Ron. We get there, and my brother Ron, he chooses somebody else. Now, can you believe that? Now, I mean, he's got the best canoeing partner in the world who wants to be with him, and he chooses somebody else. He chooses Mark Longhauser. That was his name. So him and Mark, now I'm like, now who am I going to get stuck with? Now, you know who I get stuck with? I get stuck with Chuck. Now, the only thing I know about Chuck is Chuck is an angry individual, and he, he gets mad at playing basketball, and I make fun of Chuck, and now I'm going to be in a canoe with Chuck by myself along the Little Miami River. I know I'm going to see Jesus that day. You know what I'm saying? So we start canoeing down the river, and Chuck says, hey, let's have some fun. I said, okay, well, what's that? Let's tip the boat. And I'm like, what? Did whoosh. He tips the canoe over. Have you ever tried to get a canoe out of the water when it's full of water? You're like... I mean, so the first couple of times I'm like, don't, don't do this. This is not fun. And I'm thinking, why can't I be with my friend or my brother Ron? But now I'm with Chuck and this is not cool. God, why do you hate me? You know what I'm saying? And so we, we start canoeing a little bit more. And then he tips again. About the third time that we tip, I start thinking, hey, this is kind of fun. This is kind of fun. We tip the canoe about another 14 times. We were so slow because we were tipping the canoe that our youth minister came back and started yelling at us, and we tipped his canoe. And so we, we, just, we just had a, a great, great time. And from that moment on, Chuck and I became best friends all through high school. Chuck was with me when we were, we were in chorus together, and we sang together. We sang in church uh, events together. He came to youth group all the time. We rode motorcycles together. We, we crashed in trees together. We went racing down there he had he had this 1974 ford torino how many of you had a ford torino it was a cool car right 351 windsor in this thing it was awesome and uh so we would go racing down highway 52 and that thing it was just a boat i mean just going down the road and he had two speakers in the back and they weren't tied down and so when we went around a curve the speakers would slide around and he'd say hey watch out that's my surround sound back there it was all just going all around us so we had a good time and I love Chuck, and he became my very, very best friend all through high school. Now, I tell you that because you have a story like that, too. Somebody that you connected with, that you thought you would never get along with, you thought you would never do anything with, you didn't think you'd ever be friends with, and something happens, something clicks, and you become friends with them, and maybe you're still friends with them today. 
Chuck was that guy to me because we connected to one another. Now, we've been going through this new uh, sermon series here, Life on Mission. And last week, we talked about an overview of just that God desires to be with people who are lost. He wants them to find a way home. He's passionate about them, and we need to be passionate about them as well. Today, we're going to talk about connecting. This is the first kind of action step as we go through the next several weeks about how do we be on mission for Jesus, making Jesus' mission of winning lost people our mission. And the only way you're going to do that is if you connect with people. So I want to read you this little story. We're going to walk through here, just do a little Bible study. I'm going to try and do it with minimal notes, so hopefully I don't run too long. But just walk us through in this conversation that Jesus has with this man named Zacchaeus. So let's start here in Luke 19. And verse 1, it says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now let's just pause for a moment and think about Jericho here, right? We've heard of Jericho before, Jericho in the Bible, right? In the Old Testament, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Does no one know that song? (laughs) You know, and the walls came tumbling down, you know. And so this is a Jericho. It's about 50 miles or so west of of, um, the Dead Sea. So you think about where the Dead Sea is, you got Sea of Galilee, Jordan River come down, Dead Sea down here, go 50 miles west, and Jericho's up in this northwest corner. And uh, Jericho is a town that is a great trade route between east and west. So anyone that's doing any major traveling from east and west is most likely going to go through Jericho. Jericho was the place where they would travel from Jerusalem. Jesus told the story, right? A man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers. And he tells the story about the, the Good Samaritan. So he travels down to Jericho. They generally would cross over the Jordan River and then come up on the east side of the Jordan River, which was called the King's Highway, to avoid going through Samaria, right? That place that the Jews don't want to go through. So here is Jericho. And because of where it sits with this major trade route, it was a great place for the governing authorities to levy a tax. And so anytime that there's a port or there's a major toll road or something like that, you know some government official is going to figure out a way to charge you some money. And that was happening in Jericho. And then we see this in verse 2. It says that a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. What do we know about this man Zacchaeus? Not a whole lot, but we know that his name is a Greek name. Zacchaeus is a Greek translation of a Hebrew name, Zacchaeus, which means righteous one, which is interesting because Zacchaeus is anything but righteous. Now, most scholars and commentators would tell you that Luke's audience probably does not know any of the name uh, issues with Zacchaeus' name. The audience that Luke writes to in his, his gospel is a Gentile audience, and so they're probably not picking up on this. But I would dare say that Jesus' Jewish friends would have known a little bit about the name Zacchaeus. Interesting that this man has the name Righteous One. And it says that he is a chief tax collector, which is interesting. He is an architeliones, is what it is. It's only used one time in the New Testament here. Teliones is what we translate as publican or tax collector. They were someone that the government had placed in charge. They farm out the collecting of taxes, and they would collect taxes for the publicum, which was the treasury. And they would collect two types of taxes. There was your direct taxes, and then there was customs. So you just have normal taxes, and then you got additional customs on top of things. And it tells us that this guy is a chief tax collector, meaning so he's kind of he's elevated as a tax collector. He knows a little bit more. Maybe he has several people underneath him. And it says that he was very wealthy. He was using his governmental position to extort money from individuals. The way they would do this is Rome did not care how much money you charged as a tax collector as long as they got their cut. So if Rome said there's a 3% tax for anyone to use this road, the the tax collector might say, you owe 5%. They would keep 2%, they'd send 3% on up to, to Rome. And that's what this man Zacchaeus is doing, a tax collector. And because of that, he's hated. Now, we, no, nobody likes the IRS, right? Nobody likes a tax collector. Nobody likes the IRS. Nobody likes anyone who's taking money from us for against our will. And it, just as frustrated as we get about it today, they were that frustrated about it in his day. He was hated, and not only was he hated, but one of the things about him is that he, being a Jewish man and doing this work for a pagan government, made him hated all the more by his people. The Jewish people saw Jews who would take that job as traitors. One, because they thought it was blasphemous to give tax to a pagan king. 
But then they hated it that one of their own kind, one of their fellow brothers or sisters in the Jewish family would take this job and extort money from them. And so because of that, they would not let them be a part of Jewish society. They would ostracize them. They would exclude them. They would not let them come into synagogue. They would not let them participate in any of the worship activities because they saw them as being uh, morally unclean having dealt with this tax collecting business. So here Zacchaeus is, the only friends that he probably has is other tax collectors, other people who are on the government payroll. But verse 3 tells us that he wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short and he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming by that way. So here this man is. Nobody wants to, him to be around. He knows that Jesus is coming his way, and he wants to see Jesus. He, he probably heard the stories about, here's a guy who loves people. And maybe Zacchaeus is thinking, maybe this guy will love me. Maybe he will at least talk to me, because I've heard that Jesus has talked to other tax collectors. In Matthew chapter 5, we know that Jesus sat down at the house of Levi, who becomes Matthew, the writer of the gospel. And maybe Zacchaeus heard about that. But his physical stature did not allow him to see over the crowd. And so he runs ahead. He knows where Jesus is going. He runs ahead and he gets up in the sycamore fig tree here. Now, the sycamore tree that's described here is not like sycamore trees of North America. It gets about 40 feet tall or so, but it really spreads out. It branches out, and so it has a huge trunk at the base, and it has very uh, many lateral branches, which makes it easy for him to climb up like a ladder, which is an undignified thing to do for an adult man in this culture. Much like the father who tucks up his cloak and runs out to meet the son in the prodigal son story, that was an undignified behavior in that story there. And so this is kind of an undignified thing, but Zacchaeus doesn't care. People already hate him. What does it matter if someone thinks he's being uncouth? He doesn't care. He wants to see Jesus. He climbs up into this tree to see Jesus. Verse 5 says that when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he saw him. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and he welcomed him in gladly. Now what I find interesting is here Jesus is walking along and he looks up and there's this little tax collector dude up in the, up in the tree here. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, tax collector dude, what you doing up there? He calls him by name. Now, I bet that Zacchaeus had been called a lot of things before, but his name was probably one of the least of them. And when Jesus comes by, he doesn't call him any derogatory term. He doesn't say, hey, jerk, get out of the tree. I don't want to, I, I, you're, you're, you're messing up my shade. You're, you're, you're kind of ruining things for you. I, I got something going on here. He doesn't do that. He calls him by name. He says Zacchaeus. Calls him his name. Sometimes there's a comfort that comes when someone just calls us by our name, isn't there? When you sit down and, and, and someone just says, hey, Steve. That's why I like having a name tag on. <laughs> That's why I like having a name tag on. And I like you having a name tag on. So when I come and I want to meet you and I want to talk to you, I don't go, hey, you. Man, woman, <laughs> I like to be able to call your name, and you like that too. And when we wear our name tags, it says, I want people to call me by my name. I want people to know, hey, Steve, I want it to first, you know, your most excellency, your worshipful majesty, any of those things would have been good, but I just put Steve to be down here. You know what I'm saying? We like to have our name called because there's, there's a friendliness that comes about with that. And Zacchaeus had his name called to him by Jesus, the very creator of the universe. And then Jesus says something. He says, he says, hey, I'm coming to your house today. Now, I just want to ask you, if Jesus were to just show up right now, I mean like right now, and come to you and say, hey, I, after church, I'm coming to your house and I'm having lunch. How many of you would think, oh, no, did I put my dirty underwear away? You know some of you are thinking that. You're like, I think it might be on the bathroom floor with the wet towels and my shoes are over here. And then you're thinking, uh, you know, is the house a mess? Are there dishes in the sink? Is there, is there you know, something laying out? You know, do I got to cover up my DVD collection because he doesn't want to see Scarface or whatever you got? Or I got to make sure that Way FM's on the radio because he don't want to turn around and hear Bob and Tom show. Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. You would be a little nervous if maybe if Jesus came by and said, hey, I'm going to come to your house today. But Zacchaeus says, okay. And he comes down and he goes over to his house that day. And it says this. It says in verse 7, 
It says, all the people saw this and began to mutter as he had gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, I love this part of the story. They're all talking as if they're saints. Oh, my goodness. You see what he's doing? Oh, my dear. I can't believe he's going there. And, they, and, th- and I bet they said this. We need to pray for him. We just need to pray for him. Which means we need to get together and talk about him. And so that's probably what they did. They get together and they start murmuring. In fact, the word here, talk about where they're murmuring, is the same word that's used when Jesus said, and, and sat in the, ha- uh, uh, the house of Levi, the tax collector, it says they were all outside murmuring. And they're like, oh my goodness, he goes to be with sinners! As if they're not sinners. But they were, but they didn't see it that way. They saw him not only as a chief tax collector, but as a chief sinner. Way worse than them. When he sat down and ate with them, Jesus was saying something in that culture that we don't really pick up in our culture today. When we invite someone over for dinner or for lunch or out to lunch or whatever, it's just kind of a casual thing. Hey, you want to go to lunch today? Yeah, we'll go to lunch. And we might go to lunch with someone that we hardly really know, and we go get our little whatever, burger and fries, whatever you get, you know, your Subway sandwich, whatever, it doesn't matter. And we sit down, and we just kind of make some talk. Okay, see you later. And we go back to work, and we don't think anything of it. We don't necessarily think that our act of having lunch somehow bonded us together, that our act of having lunch somehow uh, made us besties. But in Jesus' culture, when you invited someone to lunch or someone to dinner, you were showing approval of that individual. You were saying that, that I accept you. I let you into my home. I let you have part of the meal. That's why David was so upset when David was betrayed. David said, I ate with him. And yet he betrayed me. That's why the meal of the Last Supper is such a betrayal that we don't seem to pick up on because Judas is eating with them. He's eating the Passover meal. All the elements, the, the lamb and the, and the unleavened bread and the, and the fruit of the vine and all these different things, and yet he still goes out and betrays Jesus. He ate with them, and Jesus was saying, I accept you, even in his state where he had already decided to sell Jesus out. And Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, man, I I accept you as a child of God. Not that Jesus has accepted him for what he is doing, but he accepts him for who he is and nothing more and nothing less. Sometimes you and I just need someone to accept us, not because of what we can do for them or who we are or how good we are, but just because of who God has made us. Just accept me for me. How many of you have seen the movie, uh, Some Kind of Wonderful? Anybody in here seen that movie? Okay, two of you will get this illustration then, so there's no point in telling it. But in the, in, the, in the movie, Some Kind of Wonderful, there's a scene where the dad is yelling at the son because the son, is, uh, he's a mechanic at, by, at night, kind of working in the sh- gas station, and uh, he's real artsy, and so he likes painting and doing stuff like that. And his best friend's a tomboy. And so he's telling his dad, he says, do you ever have a guy in, in high school that never just fit in? You know, and he goes, yeah, we had him all the time. And he goes, well, I'm that guy. You know, my best friend's a tomboy. I like art. I work in the gas station. He says, that stuff doesn't go over in your modern day high school in California. And he's yelling at his dad and he says, when are you going to just love me for me? Not for who he wants to make his son. I think Zacchaeus just wanted someone to love him for who he was. And Jesus did that. In verse 8, it's very interesting here because Luke kind of moves through the story quickly. And he says this. It says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to, the, said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, I wish, as a preacher, that I had the sermon that Jesus preached so I could preach that when we had a building campaign. (laughs) Could I get done preaching to people? I give half of my possessions here now to the building campaign. We'd have a third phase like, bam, right now. You know what I'm saying? We don't know what Jesus said to him. All we know is the response that Zacchaeus gives. And he says to him, he says, I give half. Now listen to what he says in the text here. He says that I will give half of my income. That's not what he says. He says, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. 
Now, I wrote some notes down here because I couldn't remember these, these numbers here. So let me just ask you, you know, if, if you were to, we think about Bill Gates. I know he's like probably second or third richest guy in the world now. The, uh, Jeff Bezo, Be- Bezo, Bezo, what's his name? Amazon dude. He's like number one or something. None of you care. Okay. <laughs> me either. You know, we get to heaven. We're all going to need Jesus all the same. But let me just talk a little bit about, let's just imagine that Bill Gates, Bill Gates came in here and he heard this wonderful, powerful sermon, which you know he would, right? And so he hears this wonderful, powerful sermon, and then he stands up and says, I give half of my possessions to Lehigh Acres Christian Church. I would be like, wow, that is awesome. How much money is that? Well, let me tell you. Bill Gates' annual income is three billion seven hundred and ten million dollars you can go online i found this thing you can go online and google ask that and it brings up bill gates's name and it says since you've been reading this bill gates has made eleven thousand twelve thousand thirteen thousand thirteen five thirteen i mean it's like an auctioneer thirteen five thirteen five thirteen fourteen fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars and it just keeps going up and up and up if he were to give half of that that would be one billion eight hundred and fifty million dollars I think we could build something with that. I mean, just a little, a little something. But that's not what Zacchaeus does here. He doesn't give half of his salary. He gives half of his possessions. Bill Gates is estimated to be worth, this was in 19, uh, 19, in uh, 2017, he was estimated to be worth $90 billion. So if he gave half of that, that would be $45 billion. We'd have a jacuzzi baptistry if we had that kind of money. (laughs) I'd be preaching from a leather chair up here, (laughs) you know, fans on me, (laughs) eating grapes, you know, whatever. (laughs) That's how I pictured it. I don't know how you picture it, but anyway. Zacchaeus gave half of his possessions, man. It wasn't like, hey, I'm just going to give half of my salaries. I'm going to give half of all of my assets, everything that I have. I'm going to give this to the poor, to those who need it the most. And then he says, and anyone I've cheated, I'll pay back fourfold. He knew he had cheated people. He knew that a tax had been levied and he, uh, he extorted more from them. That's how he got so wealthy. And he says, those people that I have cheated, I'll pay back fourfold. If you go back and read in Exodus, you will see that if someone stole a sheep, they had to pay back fourfold for a stolen sheep to the, to the original owner. It was the second most strenuous penalty levied against the theft in the Old Testament. Notice that what he says he has to do and what Jesus says to the, to the rich young ruler is very different. To the rich young ruler, he said, you have to go sell all of your possessions, give those away, and then come follow me. And the guy went away sad. But he doesn't tell Zacchaeus, hey, that's great, you're giving half of your possessions, but you've got to give all. He doesn't ask that of him. Why? Because he sees the heart transformation in Zacchaeus. It's not about the money amount. It's about the attitude of the heart. The rich young ruler couldn't get rid of anything. Zacchaeus willingly says, hey, man, let me just give half of this away and let me pay back. Let me make things right. And then look what happens in the text. It says that Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. What Jesus was saying is, This man has found the key to salvation. It's repentance, changing of heart. He clearly believes in Jesus or he would not give this money away. He would not change his life. He believes in who Jesus is. He believes in the message that Jesus is saying, and he responds in a way that that demonstrates repentance. It's what James talks about in the gospel when he talks about faith and works. If you say that you have faith, then your works ought to back the faith that you claim to have. So if you claim to be a follower of Christ, then you should act like Christ, which means that maybe we should be loving our enemies like Jesus said do. And we should live not of this world, but live for the world to come. That we should let our light shine, that people see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven, all those different things. But too many of us claim the name of Christian, but we live like children of Satan. Jesus says, that's not, that's not going on in this house. And then he says something. He says, this man, too, is a son of Abraham. They saw him as a traitor outside of the family. Jesus is not talking about that he, he, we can go through some bloodline here, and that's what makes him a, a son of Abraham. He's a son of Abraham because he's responding in faith to God, just like Abraham does. 
Abraham is a man of faith because he responds faithfully to God. And Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that, that, that true children of Abraham are those who, who respond to Jesus Christ as the revelation has been given to them. So it's not about bloodline. But you've got to know that that was a thorn in the side of people who were murmuring and saying, he sits with sinners, and Jesus is saying, hey, he's part of the family. He's part of the family. You know why? Because he's responding with repentance and humbleness. And God is saying the same thing to us. And then he says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus answers the question to the murmurs that the people were having. When they were saying, this guy goes and sits with sinners, Jesus answers, you know why I'm doing that? Because they're lost. And my whole job here, he's to die on the cross. He dies on the cross, though, why? So that he can redeem the lost. And Jesus is saying, I, I, I've come here that I can seek them, and that's what he's doing. He will save them in just a few years when he dies on the cross. He says, this is why I'm here. I'm doing the seeking. I already know I'm going to be doing the saving. He knows what he's going to do. He knows he's going to go to the cross. He knows he's going to obey the Father. He knows he's going to die. He knows his blood's going to be shed. He knows that's going to pay for sin. But while he has the time, he's doing some seeking. And he says to the crowd, you know, you're all upset of why I'm with this guy. But the reason I'm with this guy is because God has sent me to seek him out. Because he's wandering out there. He doesn't know who he is, where he is, where he's going. And I want to bring him back into the fold of God. Any parent that would lose their child would do anything to find that child again, would you not? If you've ever walked somewhere and lost your child for a moment, you know the panic that comes over you like, oh my goodness, what is mom going to say? Well, that's maybe the second thought you come up with. The first thought is, where is my child? And, and, and you don't care if that person's a stranger. You walk up to them and say, hey, have you seen my kid? Hey, have you seen this little kid like this? This little girl got a little red hair, little freckles all over you. Have you seen her? And you'd be running around, and people would say, you're crazy. You would say, I don't care. My kid's lost. Someone help me. That's Jesus. I don't care what you say about me. You think I'm sitting with a bunch of, a bunch of evil people in society? I don't care. He's lost, and he needs to be found. Why do we have this story in our text this morning? Let me, let me just tell you why. It's all about connecting with people. You know, I find it interesting that people say, well, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna evangelize. I want to do what Jesus calls me to do, but I want to do it in my church, in my four walls, in my car, in my house, and I don't want anybody to, to, to mess anything up. But if they come and ask me, I might invite them to a Bible study, and I might tell them that the preacher will go talk to them. That is not how you evangelize. That's how the church thinks, in general, how we evangelize. We invite them to our little Bible study, we invite them to our church, and we push them off to the preacher. We push them off to the youth minister, we push them off to the elders, and we go, Whoa, I did my job, I brought them to Jesus. No, you didn't. You just stressed out my schedule and gave me more people to talk to. You should talk to them about Jesus. Connect with them. Go on a canoe trip with them someone that you don't want to be with let them tip you over three or four times in the river learn to love them build a relationship with them and they will come to know jesus because they knew someone loved them like jesus you don't have to be a great theologian you don't have to answer all their how did god get here kind of questions they may have those just love them connect with them one of the things that we're going to be going through this week, and our song team can go ahead and come as I wrap things up, is this idea that we need to stop seeing people as projects and see them as people. Yes, we want them to come to know Jesus, and so we, our goal then is to share with them the gospel. I wouldn't hide that from them. When they know you're a believer, they're going to kind of know at some point, you're going to ask them to come to church, you're going to ask them, do they know Jesus? You're going to do all that. But they won't care about any of that if they don't feel like you love them for who they are. Which means sometimes you've got to listen to some of their cursing when they talk. Sometimes you, you might have to sit at the bar with them and don't drink and set a better example. Sometimes you go to the ball game with them 
and they're maybe a little rude. Sometimes you have to deal because they wear a shirt that has a slogan that you don't really like and it's not really honoring of God. But you go through those things so that they know that you love them for who they are, that you're willing to sit with the Zacchaeuses and you don't care what the church people would say. Oh my goodness, they went to the crystal pistol to go talk to some people. Well, the people there need Jesus. And I would just ask you, who do you need to connect with? Is it your neighbor? Is it a co-worker? Is there a student who sits in a class with you and no one talks to them because they, 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 you know, whatever, they dress a certain way, they talk a certain way? Jesus is saying, you know what? See them up in that sycamore fig tree and say, hey, let's go get some ice cream today. Hey, let's go to the ball game. Hey, let's sit together at lunch. I'd like to talk to you. Where are you from? What's your name? Why are you here? Where are you going? Whatever it is that you do. But you'll never, you'll never reach them for Jesus if you don't connect with them as a person. Let's pray.